When I was a little boy back in the 50s, this was a commercial on the radio and the television. This was Ready Kilowatt. We actually had to advertise to use electricity in those days. You see, I'm from the 50s. I grew up as a little boy back then. Ready Kilowatt was my best friend. He powered my erector set. He powered my first transistor radio. He ran the television in the house, and he ran the refrigerator, which was relatively new technology. My grandparents had an icebox. America was ushered into a new era of electricity. That clean, efficient, and cheap power that comes out of that wall socket in your house is just an amazing thing. It just put the, the country on a path up and to the right. In 1957, however, our Soviet neighbors put this beeping satellite over our heads called Sputnik. It started what was then called the, the, the uh, space race. And it was uh, quite exciting, but also very terrifying, and America responded. We responded by putting a man on the moon. But to put a man on the moon, we had to build this incredible rocket. Lots of technology, lots of electrical technology, storage systems, batteries, fuel cells, amazing things. And we did it eight times. Coming out of the 60s, having won the space race, technology began to get a little personal. We uh, in enter Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak with the Apple computer. This is the most amazing box that we put on our, our desk at home. It, it could do almost everything that those big boxes behind glass walls could do. A personal computer, amazing, an electrical device. But it did use electricity. Then computers began to be connected, and one person could talk to another. OK, no sound. You've got mail. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so the computers began to be connected, and pretty soon they were connected all over the world with this thing called the World Wide Web. And you could, in fact, talk to anybody, anywhere, view anything, anytime. An amazing, an amazing invention, all from the comfort of your desktop computer. But pretty soon, the 2000s rolled around, and the smartphone rolled around. This amazing device that we fit comfortably in our pocket is the most powerful computer ever. It can talk to people, it can take pictures, videos, it gives us information about maps, but it uses a lot of electricity. Now I'm not talking about the electricity that you plug it in at night and charge it up. I'm talking about when you make a request. You make a simple request on this phone and you activate computers and network switches and all kinds of other electronics equipment, perhaps all over the world. In fact, the 1.8 billion phones that have now been in use use, uh, use about the power of 1.8 billion refrigerators. So one phone, one refrigerator. A lot of people have these phones that don't have refrigerators. So uh, this is the world we live in today. It's a first world. We have these incredible uh, devices called smartphones. We have wonderful electricity. It keeps our homes comfortable. All's good. Let me uh, tell you a little bit that electricity is not as good as you think it is. Electricity actually is the dirtiest business on the planet. That amazing power that comes out of the wall socket, the, the clean, efficient, cheap electricity, actually has to be produced. And it's produced mostly by burning fossil fuels, a very dirty fuel. 80% of our power in this country comes from fossil fuels. So let me show you a clip here, a two minute movie clip from the movie Pandora's Promise, which I helped co-produce. It's about the relationship between energy and the environment. In it are two, two environmentalists. The first is Stuart Brand. He's uh, the famous uh, author of the Whole Earth Catalog, some of you may recall from the 60s. And the second is Michael Schellenberger. Michael Schellenberger is the co-author of the paper The Death of Environmentalism. <laughs> Global South is very warm and they would like air conditioning. And up till now they've not been able to afford it, but now they can. They're getting out of poverty. And they need great electricity to run their air conditioners. Of course, various environmentalists freak out at that point. But on the other hand, if you could have vast quantities of really, really clean energy in the developing world in the next decade or so. That is such an improved world that takes your breath away.
assuming that the world continues to develop and that China and India and Brazil become rich countries over the next half century or century. How much energy is the world going to use? When you start running those numbers, it's a sobering exercise. And you may not be able to get that number exactly right, but I realize we're going to basically double the amount of energy we consume by 2050. We're probably going to triple it or quadruple it by the end of the century. And meanwhile, if you want to stabilize emissions at some reasonable level, almost all of that energy has to be clean energy. You know, you've got to not only you know, create a clean energy infrastructure to replace the fossil fuel infrastructure we have, but we have to create yet another one, or maybe two of them, between now and 2050 or 2100 in order to reduce our emissions to stabilize the climate. And that is just nothing that anybody has really been talking about or dealing with for the last time. So how much energy do we actually use? We measure energy today in the unit of quads. A quad is one quadrillion BTUs. A quadrillion is a one with 15 zeros behind it. Extraordinary large number, so large, I don't think anybody can really appreciate what it is. Well, the world actually uses 500 quads. So 500 with 15 zeros behind it, quads of energy. So as Michael said, he ran the numbers and it was sobering. So I did too. And I tried to take these numbers and put them in something that I hope you all understand. So this world that you see here in 2050 will use about 1,000 quads. Today we have 500. That's a gap of 500. Well, we could very easily just double what we're doing now and supply the world's energy. But maybe there are other ways. I'm going to take you through four choices of power that we have to provide for that world. First is solar. One quad of solar would completely cover the state of Rhode Island. And I don't mean just the cities, buildings, and houses, and fields and stuff. I'm talking about every square inch of Rhode Island would be covered by a solar panel. Well, what does 500 quads look like? 500 quads is bigger than the state of Alaska. Can you imagine covering the state of Alaska with a, with a solar panel? It'd be totally black underneath it. The animals couldn't live there. People won't live there. The entire state of Alaska. So people talk about wind, wonderful resource. Everybody knows what the wind is. One quad of wind would take a wind farm the size of the state of Maryland, which is about 10 times as big as Rhode Island. What does 500 quads of wind look like? The entire North American continent, all of the United States, most of Canada and Mexico, 500 quads. That's what we have to produce in the next 40 years to satisfy the developing world. Well, what about coal? This is a very popular fossil fuel that we have. Uh, coal uh, today provides about 80% of our, our fossils provide about 80% of our, our energy needs. One quad of coal would cover a football field five miles high. Five miles. That's as high as airplanes fly. So you can imagine what that's like. So if we took our 500 quads today and just duplicated that, we'd be duplicating our fossil burning. Well, we know that fossil fuels and the burning of the CO2 is causing climate change. So what does that mean? Well, it turns out we've actually already run this experiment. China ran this experiment. Uh, uh, in uh, 2000, China was using about 40 quads of power. Today, they're using 110 quads of power. This is Shanghai as of this morning, December 7th. They're having the largest smog day uh, ever recorded. It's over, it's over the... Uh, meters they have there. It's the worst pollution ever. Schools are closed and airplanes are grounded. It's so bad. This is a result of almost tripling a country's energy supply, mostly by fossil fuel. So the one area I haven't covered yet is nuclear. Ah, nuclear. I can uh, see it now. People's uh, eyes are starting to get a little mushroom clouds in them. They hear sirens going off in their heads and there's even people out there whispering what about Three Mile Island, and what about Chernobyl, and what about Fukushima? Well, those are things to worry about, and they're tragic. But I will tell you that is 1960s technology. And just as our technology, computers and other things, has transformed, so has nuclear power. Let me give you some examples. 
We have actually designed, built, and tested a nuclear reactor that will not melt down and cannot melt down. We actually tested it, and we did that 30 years ago. We actually have reactors now that can burn nuclear waste, the stuff that everyone's worried about. We can actually burn it up to make electricity and have practically no radioactive waste afterwards. These are incredible, this is, these are incredible inventions that engineers and scientists have brought us. So what does 500 quads of nuclear look like? Well, you saw solar and wind and coal. 500 quads of nuclear, 500, not one, 500 would cover an area the size of half the city of Dallas. Just half the city of Dallas, 500 quads. And that includes all the fuel handling, all the evacuation zones, all the water cooling that's required. It's really quite amazing what 500 quads would cover you. So just to give you another example, I have here in my hand one pound of uranium. Well, it's not really uranium because they would come and arrest me if it were, but it is one pound of steel, which is about the size of one pound of uranium. This uh, little one pound would light up the city of San Francisco for 14 hours, the nuclear energy contained within it. And here I have a box of soap. You might recognize this soap. It's been around for 120 years. It's called borax. In borax, there's an element called boron. And boron could power, this four pound box of borax would power San Francisco for a day and a half. Would you believe me if I told you that? Would you invest in that? I did invest in that company and we're working on that right now and hopefully in about 10 years we'll be powering the electric grid with boron from a box just like that. So you can see our, our challenges are clear. We, we have this 500 quad gap that we have to actually fill. The developing world is not going to sit still. They're going to demand it. They already are. You see what's going on in China. And I really don't want all the great cities of the world to look like Shanghai. And we need to clean that one up as well. So I'm an optimist. I love renewables. My personal commitment to renewals is amazing. I actually put 23 kilowatts of solar on my house. So all during the summer, I give back a lot of power to the grid. At night, I have no power. But I'm also a pragmatist and a realist. To run power 24 hours a day, you need either fossil or you need nuclear. Those are really our only two choices to have any impact on that 500 quads. Well, fossil, I don't think I want to live in that city, and I wouldn't want to ask anybody else to live in those cities. So I think, really, advanced nuclear is what it's all about. So I have one more little clip here. In the movie Apollo 13, there comes a time when Gene Krantz, the mission control uh, leader, challenges his folks to, in fact, save the crew. Well, I don't think we should turn everything off, and I don't think we should tell the developing world not to develop their own sources of power. I think we should, however, advocate and help them bring clean power to the market. You know, science fiction is an amazing leader of what we actually wind up doing. And the last hundred years are any indication we went to the moon and many other things. So I think the, the science fiction writers have it right. And if they are right, then nuclear is in our future. So actually, I'd like to leave you with this thought that nuclear power has advanced clearly. It's a lot better than it used to be. It's far more safer than it used to be. And the world needs 500 quads. We need renewables, and we need advanced nuclear. So I think bringing Ready Kilowatt into the 21st century, I'm going to put a green coat on him and give him the atom. Thank you. <laughs>